missing that many of those giants walk these streets that we walk in today. How many of you would respond if I said the name Frederick Douglass? Just raise your hand. He is a blood relative of Frederick Douglass, the great black abolitionist and orator. He motivates and evaluates children ages 3 to 21 in an effort to find out if they have educational disabilities and a need for special education services. He is considered a national expert on learning disabilities and their effect on black children. And don't we know that black children kind of go into the education system brilliant and just illuminated and with all this energy and suddenly once they in it, Seems like something happens. He understands this. He is an expert at helping schools and parents to modify challenging behaviors and ultimately destroy how the disruptive behavior affects them. He is considered an authority on the education of African American children and on mental health in the black community. It is a pleasure to welcome him tonight at this very special moment. He was a brother who has lectured before embassies and stadiums and museums and he's been in media and television and all of that. Tonight he's here with us to give us a moment of understanding of what we're dealing with in terms of our mind power. He has the genealogy of Frederick Douglass and the determination of Marcus Garvey. Put your hands together for Dr. stay within my time limit. First I'm going to say it's an honor to be up on a stage with all my elders here, but it's also an honor to finally be in the presence of Chief Imhotep Gary Bird. He doesn't know me, but I know him quite well because some of my favorite lectures that I watch is one called The Effects of Global White Supremacy, which feature our ancestor, Dr. John Henry Clark. Woo! Woo! Our attorney at war, Alton Maddox. <laughs> and also, a man in whose image I come, who I never had an opportunity to meet, whom I consider to be the greatest African Senate scholar of all time, Dr. Amos Wilson. <laughs> But in some way I am because of Chief Imhotep Gary Bird, who knew Dr. Wilson, I'm meeting him now. So this is an honor for me. When we talk about the economics of black people, when we talk about the spending habits of our folk, we have to look at it not only through the economic lens, but also through the psychological lens. Being a doctor of clinical psychology, one of the things that I do is I always look at whatever issue we have as a people through the psychological. One thing we know about addiction, all addiction is born of an attempt to overcome a painful set of psychological circumstances the wrong way. When we look at the shopping behavior of African people, we have to understand that our shopping habit is born of an addiction. And we shop not out of necessity. We shop out of a desire to pacify the pain of being black in America. It's very important to understand this in order to rectify the disastrous spending behaviors of American people who are of African descent. There was a study that was done. It came out last year. And it dealt with the economic behavior of African people. And it concluded that in order to 
to understand the spending habits of black people, you have to understand their peculiar psychology. They, the report said that amongst all the different ethnicities in this country, black folks stood out in comparison to them all. Not just because we spent the most, brothers and sisters. It wasn't just the fact that we spent the most on malt liquor. It wasn't the fact that we spent the most on cell phones. It wasn't the fact that we spent the most on high definition televisions. It wasn't the fact that black women lead the women of all of the world in their hair. Or the fact that black men lead the men of the world in their clothing. What we spend, but they said what was most unique about the black person that you needed to understand in order to comprehend their economic behavior was that black folk, more than anyone else in America, shop not because they need to, but because it makes them feel better. It linked our spending with our peculiar history in America. In other words, since most of us can't get the therapy we need to deal with our depression, we can't get the therapy we need to deal with our anxiety. Not that there's not therapists out there, brothers and sisters, but we know, given our relationship with white folk and white institutions, we know not to trust the white psychologists. We know not to trust the white therapists. Many parents have learned through the public schools that you can't even send your child to the school counselor to talk if there's something going on at home because if you do, that school counselor might end up breaking up your home and taking your children. And so black folk has had to come up with unhealthy ways to adapt to our oppression. The most unhealthiest ways has been to try to shock ourselves out of our misery. Have you ever noticed that after you go shopping and you come back home, while you're shopping, there's a rush of adrenaline. While you're shopping, your brain produces opiates that makes the spending of money feel good. <laughs> but by the time you get back home and you start taking the stuff out the bags piece by piece, and you look at what you paid, but more importantly, when you look at what you got left over, a depression sets in. And your brain, looking for a way to make you feel good about what you did, manipulates your consciousness and convinces you that spending all this money was not a bad thing. That's not why you feel bad. You actually feel bad. This is your brain talking to you. You actually feel bad, not because you spent all this money, but because you didn't spend enough of it. Amen. And so tomorrow you go back out to get another pair of shoes. You go back out, another pair of sneakers. You go back out to get that last knickknack. Because what you see at play here, brothers and sisters, is how your brain produces a chemical in the act of shopping that makes you feel so good that you never want to stop shopping. In order to fix this, we have to get black folk something other than shopping to make them feel good about it. That means we have to get at the crux of our psychological issue. That means we got to deal with the self-hatred. That means we have to deal with the internal racial division that is wrecking havoc, not only within the community, but amongst ourselves. I would argue, psychologically speaking, that one of our biggest problems right now as much as we preach brotherhood, as much as we preach sisterhood, one of the biggest cancers in the black community is the isolation and loneliness that black folks are suffering from on a daily basis. We'll go to church and come home and still feel lonely. Go to the mosque and come home, still feel lonely. Go to the black, black power meetings, go to the conscious 
church's seminars and still come home lonely and depressed. Our biggest issue is that we suffer from racial depression. What is depression? It's a mental illness where the mind is distorted into believing that you're worse off than you actually are. It is a mental disorder where the mind convinces the soul to believe that where you are, you must stay. Depression is a mental illness that convinces the self to believe that if you try to fix this problem, you would be wasting your time. Going back to what Reverend Youngblood said, he's absolutely correct when he talks about being comfortable with oppression. Because when you suffer from depression, the mind convinces you to believe that you cannot move from your current status. And if you believe you cannot move from your current status, the mind has to create a heaven out of your hell. That's right. As I wrap up, brothers and sisters, I want to say this. The dollar in the black community up until the night has been the devil in the black community. We have used our economics to cover up a hurt and a pain and a shame that's 150 years in the making. So here tonight, we gotta take the black dollar and convert it from a devil to a doer of good. Money is God seeking manifestation. Money is power seeking an outlet. If we are to convert our current situation into one of hope and manifestation and realization, we're going to have to treat the dollar with the sanctity and an honor that is due to the highest of all energy because only a dollar that is respected will be appropriately protected. Which means, as I leave, we have to decondition some of the core beliefs that we as a race have. One of them is, and I don't put this on the church because the church really didn't create this, but it was manipulated outside the church to our detriment, and that is that money is the root of all evil. Brothers and sisters, money is not the root of all evil. You know what the root of all evil is? The root of all evil is not having no damn money. When you go home tonight, are you backing rich people? When you go home tonight, are you scared of anyone with a five hundred thousand dollar mortgage? When you go home are you fearing for your life from people who got it all? Or are you fearing from the desperate man or woman who don't have nothing? So we have to change the mindset because believing that money is the root of evil, psychologically, it crystallizes into a belief. And now, because you've been taught it's evil, you want to get rid of it as fast as you can. And this is one of the reasons black people spend the way black people do because after all, when you're broke as hell, after all, you can say, blessed are the poor. And so we use spiritual allegory to justify our unhealthy economic and political behavior. Last thing, absolutely last, if we're going to deal with the spending habits of African people, if we want them not to spend with enemy entities, we have to create
create the agency through which they can save. That means that talk of a black dollar must be with talk of a black bank. That means talk of a black code must be with talk of a black savings and loan institution. That means talk of a black penny must be talk of a black credit union. Listen, even if black people say it, let's say we save 500 billion of the 1.3 trillion, if we take that 500 billion of organized black dollars and put it in the white bank, put it in Chase Manhattan, put it in Wells Fargo, even though it's organized because your enemy has been chosen to be a babysitter of your mother, <laughs> Your money, even organized, will work more for the European than it does for you. So with the dollars, let us talk bank. Let me leave you with a quote from my ancestor, Frederick Douglass. And I'm honored to be here at AME. When you know what AME has been to black folks in our history. You gotta understand it was black men in this church denomination who stood up against the Ku Klux Klan. I want you to understand that it was black men in this denomination, Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, Garvey before Marcus Garvey. You can't talk Marcus Garvey unless you talk Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, the first black man to say God was black. He was African Methodist Episcopal. Out of boy Elijah Muhammad went to his school as a child. My great, 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 and my great, 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 great grandpa Stephen and George, the brother and nephew of Frederick Douglass, they built an AME church that still stands feet away from where they were enslaved. My great, 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 great great uncle Alexander Wayman was the seventh bishop in AME after Richard Island. Douglass said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess the faith of freedom and yet depreciate agitation are like men who want crops without pulling up the ground. They want rain but can't stand the thunder or the lightning. They want water from the ocean but scared of the roars of the waves. He said, for the struggle to work, it must consume your whole life. It must be or it is nothing at all. He said for 20 years, I prayed on my knees to God for freedom. But the good Lord gave Frederick no freedom until I got up off my knees and started praying with my feet. He said, men may not get everything they pay for, but we will certainly pay for everything that we get. In this, we may pay with blood, we may pay with property, we will pay with our lives, but we must pay. He said, but most of all, you remember this, that the limits of tyrants are prescribed by the people they oppress. Black folk determine how poor you white people treat you, not white folk. He said, power can cease nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. To the black men here tonight, brothers, I want to say it's on us. I want to say that our women want to honor. They want to respect. They want to cherish the black men, but damn it, we got to give them reasons to do that. Our children want to look at us with honor and with respect, but damn it, let's give them a reason for that. Black men, I'm here to say here and now, that standing in the Christian church, we should know the lesson. Yes. Jesus had to pay in blood for the sins of the world. Dr. King had to pay in blood for your right to be equal. 187,000 Africans in the Civil War paid in blood for your right to be free. 
And I'm telling you right here, right now, brother, that the road to freedom, the road to justice, and the road to equality